All right, so next up, I'm happy to introduce Saurabh Sinha. From, uh, Saurabh is an associate professor of computer science uh, and the Institute of uh, Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois. And I'm happy to have him here to tell us about his project, Knowing. Well, thanks, Michael, and uh, thanks to the organizers of this uh, conference for having me here and giving me the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, our center. Um, is there a laser pointer? So maybe, maybe I should just use the, it's okay. Um, so um, I'm here to talk about or, or, or describe uh, our NIH-funded uh, BD2K, or Big Data to Knowledge Center for Excellence, um, called Knowing, and uh, it, the, it's an acronym for Knowledge Engine for Genomics. I'm a, a computer scientist in the computer science department at uh, Illinois, um, but I, I'm also a, a faculty in the Institute for Genomic Biology, uh, which means um, um, my interests, my research interests are primarily in, um, in, in machine learning and um, biology. Um, so I'll be, um, um, but, but this is the center, as you'll see, is, uh, um, covers many different um, areas and um, uses Hub Zero as the core cyber infrastructure. And so I think um, I'm very excited on, on that account to be here to learn more about Hub Zero, but you'll soon realize I don't understand about 80% of the technical words uh, I'll, I'll be using in, uh, related to Hub, Hub Zero. So um, um, I, I should start by thanking um, uh, the people who do understand those technical words, uh, starting with Umberto Ravaioli, a, a, a professor in ECE at Illinois, Omar Sob, who's our uh, star programmer who does all the Hub Zero related work, uh, Charles Flatty, who's a postdoc, and, and uh, close to 20 to 25 other people in, in the Knowing Center. Um, and I'd be happy to um, entertain any questions um, about our, how we are, how we are, what we are doing with the infrastructure, and, uh, and, and, and hopefully I'll be able to ask you guys more questions later about, uh, about several of the cool things you're doing. All right, so what is um, the center about? It's, it's a center that uh, hopes to build a knowledge engine for genomics, and it begins with the, uh, um, uh, the observation that a very common paradigm in today's genomics can be stated as knowledge-guided analysis of user data. Um, um, so Amy mentioned a, a few minutes ago that there's a lot of interest in um, sharing data to the extent possible so that others can make good use of it. And um, this has already been happening in the genomics community where large consortia often publish their work and their data um, in the public domain. And then the user wants to um, utilize that as knowledge in interpreting their own data. So the paradigm here is that um, here's a biologist with their own uh, data set, often in the form of a, a set of genes. And here's the knowledge base. Uh, apologize for the small fonts. Here's a knowledge base which represents um, public domain data sets. And often, these public domain data sets also are summarized in the form of sets of genes. So there's thousands of gene sets in the public domain. And here's the user's gene set. And the user wants to know which of these other public gene sets are very similar to their own. And this somehow tells them, uh, gives them very valuable insights about th their own biology, the biology they care about. And this, this paradigm is so... Um, um, has been, has been uh, around for about 10 years now and has really caught on uh, with the biologists. And there are um, close to 100 different uh, web servers that implement this very paradigm in different forms with different statistics. I'm just listing a few of them here. And the vision of our center was to take this paradigm to the extent it can go in, the, in light of the, the state of the art in computer science. And so, in particular, we focused on extending this, this, uh, this, current, um, this current process um, uh, in two dimensions. Firstly, the user's data 
um, which currently has to be gene sets, is no longer going to be gene sets, it's going to be spreadsheets. And the reason is that if you collaborate with biologists, you'll soon realize that that's the common denominator in, or in, in denomination for their, um, for their data exchange. It's spreadsheets with rows being genes and columns being experiments. So, uh, and they actually have to throw away much of that information to get to this gene set level, um, you know, which is something they shouldn't have to do. And so the user's data will be in the form of spreadsheets and the public knowledge also it should not be in the form of gene sets. It throws away a lot of information. It, what we'll do is to, uh, to uh, put together a very large heterogeneous information network where the nodes are, again, genes and proteins and annotations of genes and proteins. And the edges depict various relationships among them. So there's going to be a very large network, uh, which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about in, in a little bit, um, serving as the public repository um, of uh, the repository of public, publicly available data sets. And then the user will be able to ask questions about their spreadsheets in light of this large knowledge base, which we call the knowledge network. Um, so this is basically it. This is the vision that um, we pitched to the NIH and, and, and the community liked it very much. And now it's our mandate to make it work. So, um, uh, just uh, extend, uh, elaborating on the basic idea a little bit more, so the knowledge network is a heterogeneous information network whose nodes and edges are genes and proteins, the molecular entities uh, of interest, and as well as their properties and relationships. Um, the user data is a spreadsheet whose rows are genes and, uh, as well. So here's the spreadsheet, the user data. Here are the rows in many different columns, and they may be labeled with pluses or minuses if, if these are patients who have cancer and, who, and, and healthy patients, for instance. Um, and here's the knowledge network, the public uh, in data. And remember that both of these have genes as entities within them. And so there are, the gene here, is, which serves as a row in the spreadsheet, is also uh, an, a node in the, in the graph which means that you can, you can hope to do joint analysis of these two data types. As you, as you probably know, the typical way to analyze this kind of information would be machine learning methods such as clustering and classification and feature selection and so on. Whereas those, that data type is often mined with uh, graph mining techniques, uh, graph traversals and, and various sorts of uh, dimensionality reductions and so on. So, but now you have this unique new problem where uh, the, the two different types of data, uh, data domains are, are, are connected, linked by these relationships, this common entities being present in both, and you want to you make the most of this public information in analyzing this personal information or lab-specific lab information. Um, so here's an example of, of that sort of analysis um, and uh, how, how we'd like our users to make use of the, of the knowledge engine. So our collaborators at Mayo Clinic, who are part of the, of the, of the center as well, they work on um, cell lines and try to understand which drugs um, work better, try to understand why certain drugs work and don't work depending on the person, depending on the patient. So what they do is they have you know, 300 different cell lines representing 300 different genetic backgrounds, and they expose them to different drug treatments, and they measure the responses. And so they have these response variables, which they would like to understand in terms of molecular measurements in those patients or, or those persons, molecular measure, measurements such as gene expression, genetic variation, and so on. I won't, I won't uh, um, bore you with those details. But they have these measurements in the form of various spreadsheets. And um, what they'd like to do is note that the spreadsheet has these pluses and minuses in the columns, meaning which patients responded to a certain drug and which did not. And here are the genes and the various numbers representing those patients, uh, representing the genes activity in, th in those patients. So you'd like to, they would like to take the spreadsheet and go to this knowledge engine hosted on a cloud um, and, and where at the back end is the, is the knowledge network, the information network I was talking about, and then be able to do standard analyses such as clustering or classification or regression in this case um, in the light of the, of, the, of the heterogeneous network. 
That would give them certain genes um, determining drug response as hypotheses of biological knowledge, which they will go uh, back, and this is actually happening, so these are slides from our papers, they go back and test uh, by knocking down those genes whether those genes really make a difference to the drug response. So here's an example where this knowledge engine is being used to um, come up with um, on, the, on, the, on the scale of months of time, uh, to come up with hypotheses about molecular determinants of drug response and then test them by knocking down in, uh, those genes. Um, so that, uh, uh, that was one example. Uh, coming back to the computer science parts of, 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 uh, of the center, which is what you were uh, interested in, uh, the challenges we have are related to data management to some extent, mostly related to advanced analytics and scalable computing and cyber infrastructure. Those two are where we have most of our efforts going in. Um, there's also a lot of effort being put into the user interface, um, and uh, we are also beginning to think about other challenges such as data sharing, where um, concepts such as data object identifiers or data objects per se, formats for moving around uh, these genomics data sets are being pursued with, uh, uh, within the BD2K consortium. Um, issues of privacy are, um, are, are very daunting in this field. For now, we don't have a great handle on that, and I won't be talking about that today. And I'm sure others would be. Um, uh, also, um, other ch challenges include um, the best way to provide widespread access to cyber infrastructure. We want the biologist lab to not have to buy a cluster of computers or to hire um, bioinformaticians to do their job for them. We'd like this to be the way, you know, the, this to be this, the infrastructure they invest in and, and, and we have to uh, worry about more mundane things such as payment models for that to really happen. So, all right, so let's get on with some of the actual technical um, things that we are uh, working on. Firstly, the knowledge network construction, which to remind you is about getting all the public repositories of, of genomics data into one place as, uh, to serve as the back end for our work. And this involves getting data related to all the species that, that are sequenced today. We've already done six of the main species, but there's, there's hundreds more to do. Um, there's data from many different resources representing different types of information. Again, these are biological terms I won't belabor, um, uh, but these are different kinds of molecular measurements that have been done and, and deposited, and they're all going to come together into our knowledge network, which uh, already has 200,000 nodes, uh, 60 million edges and uh, over 30 different edge types. So that's the network I'm talking about that has to be utilized uh, in analyzing the user spreadsheet. Uh, we, we, we were trying to make the knowledge network construction be a one-click operation, and there's many different steps involved, including data transformation and, and storing in different, data, different kinds of databases. Um, I'm um, uh, uh, worrying about name entity resolution and so on. Um, we're, uh, we're also trying to uh, containerize this process so that it can happen in parallel and handle different types, different sources of data uh, using the source specific uh, transformations um, and ultimately deposit all those network nodes and edges into either uh, a MySQL database or a Neo4j database, both of which are supported by our, uh, by, by our knowledge engine. Going beyond the data collection to actual uh, analysis, the kinds of um, analytics we, we support include things like random walks on the knowledge network. So why would that be useful to a biologist? Well, here's the knowledge network for you, and let's say the user or the biologist specifies a subset of genes that they uh, think are involved in their, in, in their biological process. And then you can do a, a random walk with restarts, much like the PageRank al algorithm from Google, um, and, um, and then you'll find other nodes in the network that are closely located to those, to those green genes. Um, so those are highlighted in red now. These nodes or genes are related to the, are proximal to your originally specified genes, 
and, um, and are well connected to it and, so might, and, and are often observed to be biologically relevant to the process as well. So it's the process of discovery of other related things. Um, we have been testing this approach on cancer-related gene sets using cross-validation and AUC measures. And, and I'll give you a slide on what the bioinformatician can do with this. So this is, I call this brute force method engineering. Um, so what we have here, each of these, each of these is a gene set, all right? Um, the, the rows, the columns are different sub-networks of the knowledge network. So the knowledge network was very big, but not all of it may be useful, right? What if a user wants to know um, how do different sub-networks of the original network, different types of edges, help in, in the task that I'm interested in, the task that I just presented, you know, the task of predicting related genes here. So each network would give an AUC measure, and the user wants to run that random walk with restart kind of algorithm on all gene sets um, with many, many different definitions of the network. Now, this is clearly you, you know, you, something that requires uh, scalable computing. You want the computing to happen um, in parallel as, as much as possible. Each of these numbers is an AUC value. And so uh, this, it, you can see that the columns on the left are net, net, sub-networks that help you identify related genes much better. And um, so by just, the, the user does not have to worry about knowing in advance what kind of edges are going to be most informative. They can do this kind of discovery or method engineering by systematically spawning hundreds or thousands of different uh, runs on this knowledge engine, runs of this, uh, of this random walk with restarts. Um, going beyond analytics, that was one example of algorithms. Uh, going beyond analytics, we, we recognize that scalable computing of the kind we're interested in is, is very challenging. Existing graph computations, uh, uh, perform, uh, perform poorly on large graphs, like the one we have, and existing distributed computing generally performs poorly on graphs. And so there are various um, aspects of graph computing that we, are, um, that we are systematically looking at in trying to um, and identify the bottlenecks to scalable distributed computing on graphs. Um, I'll skip this slide. Um, we are also looking at advanced interfaces, such as data spread, pioneered by uh, a colleague of mine uh, at, at Illinois, uh, which is a, a, a marriage between um, Excel spreadsheets and databases, which is a, you know, it's a place where you can, visit, you can use Excel as a front end to an underlying MySQL database. Um, we are also uh, working on various middleware, such as... Uh, drag and drop workflows. So each of these panels here that you see is the workflow of one genomics manuscript. And often these, uh, they are not published like that. No, they are never published like that. The, the, these genomics manuscripts are published with a very dense supplementary materials uh, section and which needs a, very, a, a lot of effort to fully understand um, what's going on there. And so um, what, we've done, what we are doing currently is having an army of undergraduates look at these papers and, and literally reconstruct these workflows um, that, that each of those manuscripts has, has, has employed implicitly um, and, and then you know, learn what are the common pieces, components of these workflows so that we can support um, those pieces and ultimately enable the user to build drag and drop workflows. We're also, another kind of middleware we're uh, working on is called learning-based programming, which is where you can, you, this is a high-level language, it's Scala-based language, for doing machine learning. Um, for instance, where you can declare heterogeneous data in an ER kind of uh, framework, and then um, you know, heterogeneous data such as spreadsheets and, and networks are declared um, in, um, in, 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 in this, in this uh, Scala-type language, and then um, you prepare for machine learning through feature engineering with simple commands such as this, um, and, um, and then call the learner, such as res uh, response regress, regressor.learn. And 
all of the, the dirty details of, in, of coding machine learning operate, you know, uh, programs are hidden here. It's, it serves as a higher level for, for, for calling, um, flexibly calling machine learning uh, tools on, on heterogeneous data types. So summary of knowing goals includes um, uh, large network, uh, large information network construction, um, analysis algorithms such as classification, clustering, graph mining, uh, for genomics data, scalable graph computing, advanced interfaces and visualization, and middleware. Um, and so uh, with all those goals in, in, in front of us, we need a very solid cyber infrastructure um, to serve as the focal point for the knowledge, you know, as, the, as, the, um, as, the, as the central, um, as the core of our, of our knowledge engine. And, um, um, we've, so we've chosen to use Hub Zero for this purpose, and uh, um, this, this component is led by Umberto Ravaioli. It was his um, convincing, you know, I, wasn't, I didn't even know about uh, cyber infrastructures and who are the leads in, in this field and so on, so he convinced us and explained to us why Hub Zero would be a great choice. Um, uh, and I won't tell you about Hub Zero, of course. I, I, I'm, uh, it's not in my place to do that. But I will mention some of the challenges um, or <clears throat> and opportunities that, are, that, that we are facing, um, starting with, with Hub Zero. So we want um, Hub Zero to be, um, this Hub Zero based system to be able to offer um, a very large level of scalability in terms of problem size and numbers of processes and users, um, high accessibility to big data sets, um, integrated developer workspace and production systems, and aut automation of complicated an analytics workflows. Some of the things that I already uh, introduced to you in, in our context, and things that I'm sure you guys um, worry about and work on a lot of the time, I, I saw some of the um, slides on, on Michael's talk um, addressing the very same issues. And um, so I can, I have some slides that Omar prepared for me on what they're doing uh, in this, uh, and I'll, on, 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 on these problems, and I'll just parrot them out. So um, uh, extending hub capabilities. So we want to use Hub Zero as a platform for the front end and com for community and collaboration. Um, but then lead on, uh, lead on to uh, underlying tools for enabling scalable computing and um, in various ways. So we're using this data layer is where the user submitted um, jobs from here are, are, are um, scheduled to go on to various cloud computing resources uh, using Docker and the software defined network um, um, it, well, again, I, I don't have much to say here. Um, uh, let's see. I can look at my cheat, cheat sheet for anything interesting here. Um, the, um, right, so the, the network layer is our SDN that helps us maintain the services regardless of the underlying um, network infrastructure, and the storage layer would provide all the cloud computing um, uh, components. Uh, we'd like the developer and production environments to coexist, and so um, the, with the, the production environment connecting to different kinds of um, clouds, uh, cloud providers. Uh, we are using Mesos and Swarm for uh, connecting, for scheduling uh, jobs and connecting to the, to the cloud infrastructures. Um, let's see. So uh, um, Umberto talks about uh, scalable scheduling to me quite a lot. He says uh, that in, you know, in, uh, we'd, what we'd like is fine-grained sh uh, sharing of, uh, um, of the resources and that, that where um, job types are matched to the appropriate resources at a, um, at a finer grain than separating out different frameworks or different clusters of different frameworks. And... Um, so here's an example where uh, a MISO slave is, uh, is, is, is running a Hadoop executor and an MPI executor. Um, let's see. So the application development pipeline would have the cloud file storage and sharing component. And um, there's APIs for connecting to external applications here. 
There's large file storage here. And then these, these portions would connect to the, would be uh, available or accessible to the code management platform where um, we have uh, Git repository management and, and code reviews and so on supported. Um, and finally, the Hub Zero knowing platform with interactive applications and online education system and uh, public and private collaboration areas. I should mention here that um, Omer t t t um, really likes to highlight the collaboration components of Hub Zero, and, um, and, in, in, and um, we, we think it'll be a, a very useful uh, aspect for, uh, for knowing in the future. But the fact is that we first need to make, you know, we first need to make sure that one biologist likes using the infrastructure before they can want to collaborate with others on that infrastructure. So uh, for our focus currently is more, much more on the visualiz visualization and the ease of, um, and, and of, ex of the individual's experience uh, with the assurance that once that is worked out, the collaborative aspects will automatically become um, a very big attraction. Um, what else? So here's an example application execution. So the user comes and says, here are all my inputs taken in, uh, here are all my inputs. So taken from an online form and some attached files and so on. Then the form input and data path are shared with the container. The container is started. The container then launches uh, a launch script, which then um, uh, pulls um, various, uh, does the various initializations and pulls in the Git code for building the container and then executes the algorithm on the uh, contributed in input data. And once the container is done, uh, its output is sent to a shared storage mount, um, and then it can be sent to the visualization component, um, uh, which is for which also we have a separate team trying to work out uh, in, in work out novel visualizations for the genomics uh, domain and integrating them with the Hub Zero front end. Um, example workflow design. So various, um, the, the, although the workflow components are um, in genomics are, are very diverse and 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 not, and um, highly parameterized, um, they can be thought of abstractly as being um, as having a few different types of components. So this the data selection component, where the user says, "I want these 17 types of data from these 29 different resources." to be used in this workflow. Um, and then um, the second step is where the uh, user either chooses a, a, a standard workflow um, or more likely would like to design a, you know, through drag and drop mechanisms um, um, a new workflow. Um, after that, after the workflow selection, the data has to be sanitized in different ways, uh, made compatible with uh, um, with the with the analytic tools that are that are intended, and um, um, right, so to check if it conforms to processing standards, and uh, and then the Docker containers are invoked, and and the uh, different components are run, and uh, on a cloud, and finally um, it comes back to the user. All right, so um, this is my last slide. Uh, we are trying to push the limits for big data in genomics. And, um, and, and for this, we, 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 while we, have, um, uh, dis we are um, using Hub Zero as our cyber infrastructure, we'd like to extend it to um, handle issues of scalability. Um, and uh, these are the different types of frameworks and uh, schedulers and so on that we are investing in, We're making, making code, uh, writing code to make these different components work. And um, I, 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 I'll be taking notes during some of the talks today to, um, to convey to Omar um, about who to talk to here. And I, I hope that uh, our team will be able to communicate with the relevant people uh, here and learn from you guys you know, the right ways of doing various things. Um, that's it. I'd like to thank you for your attention um, on behalf of the Knowing Center. Great. Any questions for...
showed basically the, oh, sorry, that showed um, uh, your data flowing into both MySQL and NeoForge um, um, repositories or whatever. Um, are those mirrors of each other where like the schema of the NeoForge data is, is reflected in the MySQL or, and they're just different formats that you're pushing to your users or do they actually reflect different data types that are in those? Yeah, that's a great question. No, they're not mirrors of each other. They have different schemas that, uh, but, but they, um, they, they're, they're, they're the same un, uh, data types have been mapped to these different schemas appropriate for them. So the, the data sources that are being stored there are the same, um, but they're stored in different ways. In, so the schemas for, for them would be different. I don't know if I'm, if I'm answering your question. There's a graph underlying, right? Mm -hmm. So you can store that in the Neo4j as a graph, or you can store it as in MySQL as an entity set um, of, or as different entity sets of, of uh, different nodes, the node types, and then relationships mm -hmm. among them. So the schemas would be different, but it's the same data. And, and related to that, the, um, the, the knowledge network that you have in your graph, the relations between those, um, how, how dynamic are those relationships? In other words, um, do you find that, that the relationships are evolving over time, where you might have something that uh, five years ago, this relation was, say, X, and it finds out later on that X actually needs to be decomposed into something more detailed. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you have X1, so X2, or... they, they do evolve. It's not a, so we, we, we hope to do a, a, a once in three months kind of update uh, you know, to, as, as being a reasonable resolution, uh, although they evolve at, you know, at a final resolution, but that, that's, that's, that's a manageable um, time frame to to keep things relatively current, um, but yeah, you, we're not shooting for a, a, a daily update. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, we'll thank Thorup again. Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks very much.